and I will uh, close my camera and my microphone and I will leave to, to you. Uh, just one question, since we're starting a little late, how should I time this? No, you, you can use your, your time. So you, this, this was for one hour, you can use the one hour. Okay. 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 So we are live now, I guess. Yes, we are already live, yes. Right. Right, so hello everyone. So I'm happy to introduce Daryl Learn with you today for the, for the first keynote. So it's morning for us in Europe. Sorry, it's morning for him in the US. It's afternoon for us here in Europe. So yes, I'm happy to introduce Daryl. Daryl has made substantial contributions to evolutionary computation and stochastic local search. He's a very prolific author. Uh, he started in the early 90s and up to now still maintain his productivity. His papers have received awards and nominations and are very well cited. If you read a paper in evolutionary computation or combinatorial optimization, you're very likely to find one or more of his work cited. So just to name some of the um, contributions, I'd like to mention, well, the steady state DAs, recombination operators, especially for the traveling salesperson problem, recently the so-called partition crossovers, also parallel GAs and the Island model, and also now neural networks are such a big topic. Uh, the connections between GAs and neural networks, Daryl has some pa several papers on that topic. Um, and then, well, theory of evolutionary algorithms, no free launch theory, in elementary landscapes, also applications like in scheduling in general, scheduling of satellites, and recently has been promoting this gray box optimization as opposed to black box, where the idea is to reduce the randomness of the operators and, in, and try to exploit the structure of the fitness function in order to have more effective search. Darrell has also been very wise in, in publishing tutorial chapters and giving tutorials, for example, in Gecko, which is helping very good also in, promote, in promoting the, the area. In 2019, Darrell received the ACM, ACM Fellowship for his far-reaching accomplishments and foundational work in evolutionary algorithms. And also he has contributed widely in the community. First, for example, creating the first journal in evolutionary computation, the ACJ, that is almost 30 years old now. And then now creating also a new journal, which brings evolutionary computation and learning together the TILO journal, the ACM transactions. Also active in the, in the executive and organization committees for GECO and CIGIVO, FOGA, et cetera. What is remarkable, I would say, for Daryl is that we have seen other researchers in our field that either go to industry for with startups or with joining big companies, or or they go high up in the managerial, uh, you know, managerial university senior management, or they some of them try to become philosophers, etc. But anyway, Daryl has been hands on doing research and very loyal to our field and to our community, so it's an, a nice inspiration to many of us. And well, finally, yes, um, I, no, no further ado, I'm happy to, to introduce Daryl. So the floor is yours, Daryl. All right, well, thank you very much. I'm gonna do screen share and then we'll get started. And Gabriella, you can let me know if you can see everything. Um, Right. Yes, we can see everything. Yes, sorry, I unmute myself. We, we can see your, your slide perfectly. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I wanna um, first, okay. I first wanna thank EvoStar for this opportunity. Uh, it's, it's just really nice to be able to talk to the community today. My title says recombination, parallelism and the future of combinatorial evolutionary computation. It, I was a little bit ambitious. I'm not gonna get very much to parallelism, uh, but I did limit myself to combinatorial optimization. So I'm not gonna talk about continuous optimization or things like CMA today. Uh, I just wanna thank the sponsors that have uh, supported my research over the years. I've been able to work on a lot of really great applications, large real world applications and that has influenced my thinking uh, in this area. 
I want to thank my PhD students. They've all contributed in just uh, foundational, amazing ways. I want to thank uh, collaborators, many of whom I will note as I go through my talk today, uh, things that they've done that has contributed to this work. And there's a tutorial. I wrote a chapter for the handbook of metaheuristics in 2019. You can email me, but please put subject line tutorial. That way I can spot the request and, and respond to you. Otherwise it might get lost in, in the email. Okay. I wanna first talk about intelligent local search because if we're gonna talk about what evolutionary computation has to offer, I think we have to talk about intelligent local search. And often intelligent local search means iterated local search. And if you spent very much time at all in the field of combinatorial optimization, you know there's a lot of powerful methods out there. Taboo search has is, is been extremely successful. Variable neighborhood search has been very successful. Different types of annealing algorithms line search, binary line search, uh, generalized pattern search. There's a whole community that works in that area. Uh, there's the classic Nelder Mead, and there's even population-based methods such as beam search. So we, if, if we're gonna talk about what we do that is unique, I think we have to compare and contrast ourselves to uh, local search methods. One thing I will say is that most local search methods are now extremely powerful and extremely intelligent, but there's also unintelligent local search, random local search, which just I've never seen really be competitive on anything. Uh, if you're gonna use local search, I think the first place to start is just systematic local search rather than, lo than random local search because it has a lower complexity uh, in almost all cases. And it turns out that for many domains, random mutation is just useless, it's obsolete. And if you look at the MaxAct community, the NK landscape space, all K-bounded pseudo-Boolean functions, traveling salesmen, graph coloring, many constraint satisfaction problems. Random mutation just is not useful because there are very powerful intelligent forms of local search and we should be using those instead. So I will specifically develop these ideas for SAT, uh, NK landscapes and for the traveling salesman problem today. So what is it that we have to offer to the larger community? I think it's recombination and I think it's parallelism and the parallelism is increasingly important with multi-core machines and also GPUs. Now that doesn't mean that I'm trying to compare recombination versus mutation. I'm really talking about the difference between intelligent local search versus unintelligent local search. Uh, because I'm going to assume that the intelligent local search is already in there. It's already part of what we're doing. So one of the things I'll talk about today for uh, two large classes of problems is the fact that we can now tunnel between local optima. And we, we can do this in a deterministic fashion, but that assumes that we've already found local optima. So I will also explain today how these local optima are arranged in lattices. This is new work, new material. And uh, it turns out that the space of local minima that is being filtered when we do these kinds of recombinations is just is much larger than you might expect. So applying intelligent local search before crossover, it might not always be the best thing to do, but it's almost always one of the first things to try. I would say in the domains I've worked in, more often than not, we end up using local search first and then doing evolutionary computation. Of course, if you think about mimetic algorithms or you think about hypergenetic algorithms, this idea has been around for decades. It's not a new idea, of course. So K-bounded uh, pseudo-Boolean functions. These are functions uh, which take uh, bit strings as inputs, and then there, there are small subfunctions. So in this case, I've drawn this such that there are three bits that go into this subfunction one. So this is just a small subfunction over three bits. And then this is a small subfunction over three bits. And then we add them all together in order to get our overall evaluation function. I'm showing a mask here, but really the mask is normally dropped because each subfunction knows exactly which bits that are going to be passed. Well, it knows exactly to do when, what to do when bits are passed to it. And so that will be taken care of automatically. But again, this can describe MaxAt problems. It can 
describe NK landscape problems. It can describe spin glass problems. There's just a lot of things that, that have this general structure. So for SAT, how does SAT fit this? Well, in 3SAT, what we have are clauses. Here's a clause that has three variables, x0, x1, x2. x2 is negated, and I take the or of these three, three things, and I either get a true or false. And what I want to do is to make all of these clauses true. I want true, true, true. And this is turned into a max set problem by simply adding together the evaluation or the truth value of this first clause and the second clause and the third clause. And so if all three are satisfied, I get a three. So I want to maximize the number of clauses that are satisfied. That exactly fits the mathematical structure I just showed you. One thing we should say about MaxSat is that, let me take a look at this for a second, just in case. Um, one thing we should say about MaxSat is that uh, there's a phase transition for randomly generated MaxSat problems. And for 3SAT, it turns out that uh, we are interested in the number of clauses and the number of variables. And if the number of clauses divided by the number of variables is greater than about 4.27, uh, then it turns out that the problems start to get easier as you move in this direction. On the other hand, at 4.27, they get easier as you move in this direction, meaning it takes longer to solve them. Uh, and, but that is tied to the underlying satisfiability of the problems themselves. So for problems in this range below four, they are usually satisfiable. If you generate a random problem that has a clause to variable ratio of four, odds are it's highly likely to be, looks like about 98% probable that you're gonna be able to solve that problem. On the other hand, if you're over here at five, in terms of the number of clauses divided by the number of variables, you're unlikely to solve that problem, but you can detect that quickly. And so there is problems here in this region that we're very much interested in. And so we should keep that in mind. We can't ignore the hard problems. Okay. Now, the next thing I wanna say is that we can compute the location of improving moves for all of these K-bounded pseudo-Boolean functions. This idea has been known since 1992 when Bart, uh, for MaxSat, when Bart Selman introduced this idea at AAAI. And so the idea runs something like this. If I flip this bit, and it's the only improving move I currently have, and it appears in subfunction one, and it appears in subfunction two, then I look at the other variables, this one, this one, this one that appears in subfunction one. And I look at the other variables that appear in subfunction two. And the only place there can be a new improving move, if this was the only improving move at the time I made the flip, is in these locations tied to these other variables. I do not need to look at any other bits in the space. And uh, so I was able to take the, the uh, first, I discovered this independently on my own through a Walsh analysis, which I'll mention. But I was able, my proof was general enough that I could apply it to all K-bounded pseudo-Boolean functions and also give uh, uh, complexity results, tie complexity to that results to this in a very uh, concrete, formal way. Previously, people had speculated and said, yeah, it's probably uh, constant time, but I was able to prove uh, rig vigorously, rigorously that it was constant time. And I'll show you another version of this in a, in a few minutes. So that means that random mutation, again, is obsolete. Even systematic local search is obsolete. You can compute the location of improving moves in these spaces. And of course, if we can do that, we of course absolutely should be doing that. Uh, by the way, the MaxSat community still calls this black box, even though it would not be black box under any normal definition, because we know where the improving moves are. We can compute those things by exploiting problem structure. Here's the way I came, uh, 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 came around to solving this problem from a new perspective, which is it turns out you can write down the Fourier polynomial or the Walsh polynomial for these problems that are um, a sum of small subfunctions because the subfunctions themselves are small and you can take the Fourier of those things. The Fourier will be linear in the number of components and if I flip bit three, I look at the other terms in the polynomial that interact with three, two, three, three, four, three, five, 
the only place there can be a new improving move is at bit, th a bit two, four, or five. There cannot be a new improving move associated with eight if there wasn't one there previously, because I didn't change anything in the polynomial that relates to eight. Therefore, there cannot be a new bit move there. And again, this generalizes over all bit representations that are polynomial uh, that are K bounded, okay? And so now let's move on. I won't talk about uh, that. I won't talk about um, mutation or local search anymore with respect to that, but I will talk about crossover. So here is a max sat problem. Uh, they usually are written in this uh, uh, concise form where you, you have three variables that make up a clause. That clause, this would be saying x1 is positive, x0 is negative, and x6 is positive, and so on through this. Now, even though this is written as a max sat, it could also be an NK landscape or any other type of function. And here I, uh, I've used exactly the same variable interactions. Uh, again, this could still be max sat. I'd simply need my subfunction to know that it's evaluating a, a max sat problem and to apply the negations in the proper spaces. I've named the subfunctions here A to Z because I want to uh, make some uh, points about what happens with recombination in this space. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is, is construct this variable interaction graph. And the variable interaction graph can be constructed uh, heuristically or exactly, but all it captures is the pairwise nonlinear interactions in your subfunction. You can pull those out of the, uh, the Fourier polynomial, or you can compute them heuristically. If you want to compute them heuristically, you look at a subfunction or a clause and say, okay, three and 13 appear together, so therefore they're going to be connected. The heuristic will sometimes overestimate the number of connections, but it, it never will miss a connection. So, and it's fine for a quick way of getting this graph. Now, let's ask what happens when we do crossover. Assume that I have a locally uh, optimal solution, P1, and it's composed of all zeros, just to make it easier for us to uh, keep track of what's going on here. And there's another local optimum, P2, and it has some mixture of zeros and ones, okay? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the common variables. And so it turns out that the variables 4, 5, 6, 10, 14, and 17, both were assigned zero in parent 1 and parent 2. You can see that here right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then 10, 14, 17. I delete those from my graph, and now I'm left with this. And the point I want to make is this decomposes both the variables and it decomposes the subfunctions. Obviously, it decomposes the variables because the variables are connected in subgraphs, but I've enumerated the subfunctions along the bottom. It's also decomposed the subfunctions. The reason I want to point that out is because the time to do evaluation doesn't change. You still have the same number of subfunctions. They're now just partitioned. So how do we do recombination in this space? We be greedy. We simply say, which has the best solution for this component, P1 or P2? Then we say, what has the best solution for this component, P1 or P2? And then we say, what has the best solution for this component, P1 or P2? Obviously, if I've got three components, I'm going to get the best of eight possible offspring. And in general, if I have Q components, this operator will deterministically return the best of two to the Q components. So if I've got 20 components, I get the best of a million offspring by doing this. And we're going to see that sometimes you get far more than 20 components. You can get 100 components or 1,000 components. And along with this, uh, we can prove a, an optimality theorem. So for any k-bounded pseudo-Boolean function f, if the parents are locally optimal, then all of the offspring are also locally uh, optimal in the largest hyperplane subspace that contain the two parents. So that means I would I call these quasi-local optima because it's possible that you get an offspring that isn't locally optimal, but uh, it, at the same time, it will be locally optimal in the largest hyperplane subspace that contains those parents. So it, it has properties that make it locally optimal in that sense. So what would the recombination graph look like on real world problems? Here's an air traffic controller shift scheduling problem. Uh, we ran uh, a sophisticated local search algorithm on this twice 
to create two parents. And then we deleted the common, uh, the, the common variable assignments. And what we found was it, it has this complicated variable interaction graph, but when we delete the common variables associated with these two locally optimal solutions, what we find is we actually get over a thousand components. In this case, the size of the problem was more than a million variables. We have more than a thousand components. So that means when we do recombination in this space, we return the best of more than two to the 1087th power or more than two to the thousandth power offspring. And how do we find the best offspring out of all these possibilities? Well, we simply look at each one of these little components in here. Okay, so here are the components. Again, all the offspring in this space are locally optimal in this subspace. And we simply look at the component and say, which is better, parent one or parent two, parent one or parent two, parent one or parent two. And we do that 1,087 times. And we have the best of all of those possible offspring that could be generated. So that's a huge space. And all of these are locally optimal in that subspace. Uh, here's another example. This is finding low autocorrelation binary sequences. Uh, the problem has uh, 182,000 variables. When we generate two locally optimal solutions, we get 371 components. So the partition crossover is going to return the best of two to the power of 371. I mean, those are just mind-bogglingly mind -bogglingly big numbers. Okay. Here are more problems, a sad instance, uh, 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 AI planning problem, um, uh, an auto encoder uh, problem. And uh, one pattern you might start to notice here is that these problems have a tree composition with low width. So we could apply our partition crossover, but for these problems, we could also use dynamic programming. These are all simple enough that they can be solved by dynamic programming in linear time. And this is something that, uh, uh, I've been looking at with Francisco Chicano for a couple of years. We had a paper in EvoStar two years ago and should have a journal paper out very soon now. Now, MaxSat, I'm going to talk about a way of applying recombination in MaxSat without actually having a population. And it's not going to look a whole lot like a regular evolutionary algorithm. What I'm going to do is this. I'm going to apply local search until I get to a point where I'm on a plateau. And that, that uh, always happens with MaxSat problems. You end up uh, making rapid progress until you get deep into the space and then you hit a plateau. Here, here I'm minimizing the number of unsatisfied clauses. So taking the min instead of the max. But I, I find the solution P1, then I continue to search. I move on the plateau. Maybe I even take a disimproving move and then drop back down on the plateau. I take a disimproving move, drop back down on the plateau. Eventually I find you know, I, I've been waiting for some amount of time. I have a solution currently that's P2, but I saved this P1 when I first dropped to this plateau. I can now recombine P1 and P2. I don't need a population. I simply need to save uh, points that are either locally optimal or the first points that I find when I enter a new plateau, and I can save those for recombination later. This is a strategy that's also found in the LKH algorithm for traveling salesman problems, a strategy that was developed by Helsgon. And uh, again, it can be used very effectively in combination with local search. So run local search first, then apply the crossover. There's no explicit population. We just create the, these points on the fly. So we did this, we used ADAPT G2W search, which was best in the 2007 SAT competition. We used Sparrow, which uh, won several tracks in 2014. We used these because the, co the source code was publicly available. We have compared it to more recent SAT solvers. Uh, so what we're doing is we're letting the SAT solvers run until they hit a plateau. And then when they seem to get stuck, then we start applying recombination. So the red is local search, the blue is partition crossover. Here is what happens when you get down onto these plateaus further deeper in the search space. Now we start doing crossover more often and crossover is making most of the progress now. So we ran this on a number of problems for, from the SAT competition. Um, we filtered out the harder problems because if the problem was trivially solved by local search, there was no point in applying the crossover operator. 
But on these more difficult problems, we found that the partition crossover gave us uh, significant improvement. And we did these experiments in, under exactly the same conditions as the SAT competition. That is, we gave the uh, algorithm exactly the same amount of time running on exactly the same uh, CPU as was used in the competition. And so these are improvements within the time window that's allowed in the SAT competition. And you can see we did extremely well improving on these very difficult problems. One thing I want to note about this is that when you have uh, uh, all of these offspring that are uh, gener that could be generated, if you take parent one and parent two and add them together and take their average, the average of parent one and parent two is equal to the average of all of those potential offspring. And so this uh, results in a corollary that's quite interesting. If any offspring represents a disimproving move, there must also exist an offspring that yields an improving move because that it has this average has to hold. And so this makes partition crossover very different than local search because in local search, if you have a disimproving move, it says nothing at all about finding an improving move. So now I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to talk about the traveling salesman problem. Uh, the best picture I could find was of the 50 US states. I tried to find one of Spain and just couldn't find anything after about 10 or 15 minutes, so I gave up. Uh, the idea, of course, is these are the capital cities and the states of the United States, and we're looking for the, the shortest route that connects all these things. But this is used in circuit design where you're trying to find the shortest wire to connect post. It's used in communication networks where you're trying to lay out the shortest communication networks. It's used in delivering trash where the truck in the morning wants to drive to all of the homes that it services and then go back to the main uh, facility uh, using the shortest route and the least fuel possible. Okay, again, we're going to have our deterministic crossover and show that it works in this space too. So we're going to generate local optima and then we're going to recombine them with this deterministic crossover. So first apply intelligent local search. Uh, I want to point out that if you do something, uh, if you don't apply intelligent search, you can go very wrong here. If you apply 2 op just as a naive algorithm, it will have order n cube complexity. It will have n cube complexity because you're looking at all pairs of cities and for every flip you reevaluate. Well, you don't really do that. You get intelligent evaluation by, through partial evaluation. You limit the pairs of neighbors you looked at by using nearest neighbors. And there is a way of computing don't look bits. I thought about it, putting it into this talk, but I thought it was gonna take too much time. But it goes like this. It turns out that when you find an improving move, certain things that you've checked don't need be, to be checked again because they don't have a linear interaction with that particular city. And so you can just uh, prune your neighborhood dramatically and look at only a small number of the possible moves. Now, how are we gonna do this? Here is a, a, a toy traveling salesman problem that I've laid out and I have two solutions here. I have a red solution that solid lines and a blue solution, dash lines. And I have constructed this problem on purpose so that I can show you that there are places in this graph where you can make a cut and only cut two of these common edges. So if I cut the graph here, it creates uh, like doors into, into, into these different partitions of the tours. So for example, if I follow the red line here, I can go through this group and then exit at this point. If I follow the blue line here, I can go through this group of vertices and also exit here. So I get linear independence at this cut point. It doesn't matter whether I follow the red tour through or whether I follow the blue tour, tour through, I can do either one. So I can go red, blue, red, or I can go blue, red, blue, 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 red, any of the eight combinations, which means I have a partition crossover operator and it's gonna return the best of two to the Q offspring. Now, right now we are still very actively looking at how do you find these partitions? And uh, the, this is not a closed problem by any means. Uh, you would probably look at this graph for some time before you spotted the potential for doing recombination, but there's a cut that cuts four edges here here, here, and then it splits this node that actually partitions this graph. So again, this is an area where we're still actively doing research. 
uh, we want to find as many as possible and, and find them as quickly as possible. Uh, some, there was some very nice work, uh, I think about four years ago, maybe five years ago now, that was done by uh, Gabriela Ochoa and Nada Verapin, where they generated a large number of solutions to a traveling salesman problem using chained LK. And then they asked the question, uh, how often does recombination create tunnels between these locally optimal solutions. And I should be a little bit careful here. When I say a locally optimal solution in both SAT and for uh, LKH, uh, in SAT, you have the problem that you're on a plateau and so a local optimum isn't precisely defined. So I'm just gonna call any point on a local optimum, uh, on a plateau, a local optimum. In chained LK, you have a variable neighborhood. And so depending on what, um, uh, what size of neighborhood you're using, you might have a different notion of a local optimum. But assuming that neighborhood is larger than two op or three op, all of these points would be locally optimal in the two op space or the three op space. And so what they found uh, is that, that these points that were generated by a local search algorithm are indeed connected through partition crossover. And they colored each connected group a different color. Uh, and the black, black dots are actually globally optimal solutions. And so in this problem, you actually have multiple globally optimal solutions, but those globally uh, global solutions are uh, in every case reachable through some form of recombination. Uh, there is some directionality in this graph. So I'm not saying that you can get from every point to every other point, but it, from most, in most cases, there'll be some way to get from here to there to get into these. Uh, at the very least, this gives us a lot of opportunities to apply recombination and define one of these global optima. So chained LK was used here. It could have been the, the famous uh, uh, Lynn Kernigan algorithm uh, and particularly say the hell's gone variety of that. Uh, that's not the point. The point is these tunnels do exist and they do connect local minima. Now I wanna show you uh, something else that's happening in this space. So here's a, a traveling salesman problem, looks like a circuit. It can be broken into four pieces. I'm gonna talk about these as groups of vertices. I have group, uh, the first group, which has certain vertices, the second group, which has certain vertices, third group, fourth group. And the recombination just says, do I pick parent one or parent two, where parent one is red and parent two is blue. And of course there's 16 possible solutions. But the thing I wanna to emphasize to you is that all of these solutions live in a lattice structure, right? We can think of the, the binary hyper uh, cube that uh, describes whether you're in or out or, or which you're selecting from, parent one or parent two, uh, as creating this binary hypercube. But every point in this binary hypercube is actually a local optima in the hyperplane subspace that we've been talking about. So uh, there's actually a lot more points here than you might realize. And so when we look at this uh, work that, that uh, Gabriella and Nada did, and they were generous enough to include me in that work, uh, every one of these points isn't just a local optimum. Every one of these points actually represents the top of a lattice because when I did recombination and moved from one point to the other point, I'm picking the top of the lattice, the very best offspring, but there's an entire hypercube that lives under one of these things every one of these things and under every one of these things, there are uh, potentially millions and billions and trillions of other local optima in the space. Um, so we're, we're just seeing the top of all of these other local minima that exist in this, in this space. And I can do a proof by construction to show you that that's true for the TSP. I can uh, create two locally optimal solutions that decompose decompose into N divided by C recombining components. And uh, I do the construction like this and construct exponentially many uh, local optima in these lattice structures. Okay. I wanna show you another algorithm and then uh, talk about the TSP a bit more. Uh, Joe uh, Kuberson, I think I misspelled his name there, I'm sorry. Uh, did some really interesting work about 30 years ago where he said, okay, I want all individuals in the population to have the chance to reproduce. 
two parents produce two offspring so that no gene is ever lost and mating is based on matching individuals with uh, similar fitness. And his goal was to make it impossible to lose diversity. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna generate a binary string and then I'm gonna generate its complement to make sure that every bit is, is represented with an equal uh, frequency. So here's a population I've generated with strings and their complements. I apply crossover. I start to apply selection, except I don't really apply selection. What I do is I allow the better solutions to move up in the population, the poorer solutions to move down in the population. And then I recombine strings with similar fitness. So the, the good strings recombine with other good strings. That's a form of selection. And, but the poor strings also get to recombine with other poor strings, which means sometimes these bits that I might want, for example, if I were doing one max, also have a chance to continue to rise in the population. So the alleles rise in the population, not necessarily the strings. We can do this for TSP as well. So when I apply my partition crossover, I generate the best child possible, but I also generate the worst child possible. Okay, that sounds a little crazy, but, it, but uh, stick with me. So keep both. And now I, had a, I have a PhD student who said, instead of sorting the population, uh, we're going to do the following, uh, uh, connect the population using a hypercube uh, connectivity, and then recombine element zero with A, one with nine, two with 10. In other words, recombine the first half with the second half, and then the first quarter with the second quarter, and then the next eight with the, the next eight, and then this individual with that individual. You can prove by doing it in this way that an allele can always move from any uh, parent in the population to uh, position one in log n generations where n in this case, maybe I should not use n, but n in this case is, is the uh, size of the population. So let's say p, population size is p in log p generations, uh, any edge or allele can move through the population and arrive at p0. So there's no selection except mating selection. Uh, the, the best individuals always move to the blue squares. The worst individuals move to the pink squares. And we're going to uh, show you, I'm going to show you some results on uh, a, a traveling salesman problem. This is a, a famous problem, AT&T 532. This is the first population. It's been improved with 2-op. And what are we looking at here? Each row is a tour. And I've just colored the edges a different color so that you can tell the difference between the edges. Uh, so every uh, row is a tour and every edge in that tour is a different color, except there's a bunch of black here. And I wanna thank again, my PhD student, uh, Swetha Varadarajan and Gabriela for working on this and generating some of the visualizations. So the black edges, are, uh, the, the black edges are edges that are not part of the global optimum but the color edges are edges in these local optima that are also found in the global optimum. So the, the surprising thing is that the local optima are comprised about 70% of globally optimal edges. So that means we just need to pull out all of the colorful bits here and try to get rid of the black parts. And if we can do that, we arrive at a global optimum. Uh, an easier way to look at this is to sort the edges. We no longer have a tour when we sort the edges, but we can get a better picture of how many of the edges are uh, not globally optimal, the black ones, and then how many of the edges are globally optimal, the colored ones. And the other thing that's startling about this picture is that the frequency is, is amazingly consistent across all of the local minima. Remember, every line in here is a different local optimum and I'm stacking up a whole population of these things. Now, it turns out that if you just apply partition crossover and all the edges you need are in the initial population, you converge often pretty quickly using this strategy. And this is the first population, this is the last population. You haven't lost a single edge. It's impossible for this to prematurely converge. But if you look at the very top of this figure, you'll see that there is a tour in which there are only colors and no black edges. So it has converged to the global optimum at this point. Here's looking at the same thing in a different way. This is after the first generation. These striations are due to the hypercube uh, connectivity 
in the recombination strategy. When you converge to the global optimum, you can see the black edges are sinking in the population and the color edges are rising in the population, which is what we want to have happen here. So a couple of things that are interesting about this. One is we never call the evaluation function after the first generation. And that's because since this does perfect recombination, when you save an edge, you also save its cost. And therefore you never have to access the evaluation function again. Uh, so in some sense, we sort of have convergence here in order one evaluations because we're not evaluating these tours by calling the evaluation function. You might want to quibble with that, and I would quibble with that myself. I'm not sure it makes sense to count evaluations. Uh, sometimes it'll just get you into trouble. Uh, however, this is an extremely helpful feature when you're talking about GPU or SIMD parallel environments because that cost matrix is big. It's uh, N squared and it takes up a lot of cash and you don't need to keep it around uh, when you're using partition crossover. I wanna talk briefly about the EAX genetic algorithm for the TSP because I think there's also some ideas here that we can exploit about crossover. It's a really great algorithm. Uh, so the way EAX works for the TSP is you have a red tour and you have a blue tour. Again, the blue tour is dashed, the red tour is solid. Uh, what EAX does is says, hey, if I go red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, I will get these AB cycles that are inherent in this unit graph, union graph. Then I can take these AB cycles, for example, this one, which has only four edges, I can put it here and I can use it to cut one of the parents. In this case, I took parent one and I cut up parent one using these AB cycles to make cuts. Then what I do is I simply merge these subcircuits back together in a greedy fashion and I generate the offspring. Now, the thing that is significant about this is that EAX uh, doesn't inherit all the edges. It inherits some of the, the red edges from parent one, it inherits some of the blue edges from parent two, but in the merger plot process, it can also inherit other edges and these are chosen in a greedy fashion to be short. So it does have a mechanism for adding new edges. But the population has improved with 2-op, same thing I've been talking about through most of this talk, use local search first. It generates 30 offspring every recombination. It doesn't have the advantage that partition crossover has of being able to pick the best possible offspring. So what it does instead is it generates many offspring and then selects the best of, of those many offspring. Otherwise it uses no selection. Again, there's no selection operator inside of this thing. The population is randomized. Parent one recombines with its neighbor, parent I plus one. I'm sorry, parent I recombines with its neighbor, parent I plus one. The, if the offspring is an improvement, it replaces parent I, but the offspring can also be generated so it is similar to the parent that it replaces, which means I lose less diversity that way. So here are some very interesting ideas that don't have selection, don't have mutation, except in as much as the mutation is greedy built into the recombination operator and highly effective. If we run edge recombination and use the same visualization technique, we can see that it, it drives out the uh, black edges very aggressively. The, the only problem can, that can occur is that it can also drive out one of the colored edges and uh, it can get to a point where it, it is stuck. It usually doesn't do that. Usually it converges to a global optimum for many, many, many problems, but it can get stuck and it has mechanisms to try to, to preserve diversity. Uh, here we um, aren't gonna worry about diversity. I'll tell you why in the next figure. So we can combine these two ideas. We can combine the partition crossover with the aggressiveness of EXA and uh, we can actually converge to a, a global optimum without losing all of our edges. We, we've lost more edges than if we uh, just, that if we didn't use EAX, but EAX, especially in the end, is good about jumping to the global optimum given the right uh, fodder. But we can do, we can use this trick and combine the two and really preserve diversity in our search. And you can see that very clearly in these graphics. Uh, again, each one of these is a population. It's a generation, generation one, uh, 9, 10, 19, 20, 29, so on. And uh, each row in here is an individual. This is the population in this direction. 
Now, I want to talk about uh, things that can go wrong. Uh, I'll start with two max, and this is something that David Goldberg used to talk about. I think it's in his textbook that if you have a global optimum over here at a string of all ones, and we have a global optimum here at a string of all zeros, if you recombine a string that is mostly composed of zeros with a string that is mostly composed of one, you'll tend to fall back into the middle of the space to a part of the space that isn't very good. And so recombination just hurts you when this happens. Uh, these days, this is referred to as the two max problem, or at least this version of it. But it's, it turns out that uh, uh, my PhD student Swetha uh, made the observation that this happens in the traveling salesman problem. AT&T 532 has two global optima. It turns out they're close together and they share 99% of their edges. So it doesn't really cause you a problem. They're close enough together that it doesn't cause crossover to uh, perform poorly. But there's a problem uh, U2319 there are two global solutions. Uh, they are fairly far apart. They only share 50% of their edges. And this it just wreaks havoc for uh, recombination. So in this problem, a genetic algorithm often does not do very well. I would note that this also causes problems uh, for an exact solver. Co the Concord solver, which is used as uh, branch and bound or branch and cut type methods to generate an optimal solution also has difficulty with these problems. I think when you have two global solutions, you cannot bound as efficiently and therefore it doesn't know which way to go. Uh, notice that in this problem I showed you earlier, there were many global optima. In this case, this still appears to be easy because you, you don't care where you converge. It's really this situation where you've got few targets but they're far apart from each other and it just confuses the search it ends up being a real problem. So if you look at, say, the LKH local search solver versus the EAX genetic algorithm, you see a real bias here. LKH can easily solve the 2319 problem, but EAX struggles. Uh, it solves the, uh, this 5,000 city problem, this or 6,000 city problem, this 7,000 city problem, but EAX struggles. On the other hand, EAX easily solves this 2,000 city problem in, in LKH can't. Uh, here's a 6,000 city problem, easy for EAX, hard for LKH. So there's a real bias in solvers. Now, uh, I know there's been some work in this area saying, oh, well, let's use machine learning to figure out which one of these solvers to apply. But I think there's an even easier and simpler solution. Uh, I will say about our combinations of EAX and GPX, we used to alternate EAX then GPX, EAX then GPX, but we found that the EAX algorithm was really expensive to restart. So now what we do is we run two op, we run partition crossover for a few generations, and then we finish with EAX. That way EAX only starts once and we get much better results and much faster results that way. Uh, so, I said I'd say a little bit about parallelism. Uh, in our work on these problems, we've been running population sizes of 256 for these traveling salesman problems. We've also been breaking them into islands, say four islands of 64 or eight islands of 32. And we are doing this in such a way that we uh, limit uh, migration and we, that also preserves a certain amount of diversity. But I wanna make the larger point that if you've got a multi-core machine on your desk, you can easily use four, eight cores and, and get trivial speed up on these problems. And I wanna make the point that you can run an ensemble of solvers. So here, here is the sequential uh, iterated local search method, LKH. Here is the EAX. This is the same results I was showing you a few minutes ago, except I've added more. And here we ran an ensemble of just LKH plus EAX, and you see it solves almost everything. So, and we did not, uh, we actually stripped away some of the uh, enhancements to EAX because we don't need them anymore. If EAX fails, LKH will get it. If LKH fails, EAX will get it. We don't need to try so hard to make these algorithms better. We simply run two algorithms that are maybe faster in their raw form. We also added our parallel version with, with MGA. It also is a little bit better than the EAX by itself. It has uh, it, for example, it solves 
this problem, which EX completely mixes. And if we run six, our, our six solvers here, these two ensembles together into this ensemble, we do really well and we do it really, really fast. Here's a larger set of problems on all of these problems, which go up to 86,000 cities. There's only one that we don't solve 100% of the time, and we still solve it a majority of the time. So I'm going to say something really quick about recombination and uh, the jump function, and then I'll, I'll stop. Uh, this is a nice little problem. It's basically a, a one max with a moat. So that, and the question is, can crossover help you jump from this point to that point? Uh, it's actually a symmetric problem, so we can rotate this. And in fact, if we do rotate it, we should think about it this way. We're climbing a hill, a symmetric hill, and then there's a moat, and we have to jump from the moat to the center. Uh, if you try to do this with random local search, it's just ridiculously slow to jump across that thing. I don't care how clever you get with your mutation operator, you're just not going to jump across there anytime soon. There was a paper called Fast Genetic Algorithms, at Gecko 2018 that looked at this problem and says, hey, if you increase the mutation rate, you do a little bit better, but it's, it's by a trivial amount. Uh, the code was publicly available. So we downloaded the code. We ran it for one week on, on n equals 1,000 and k equals 10, and it still didn't converge. Uh, even though this is called a fast genetic algorithm, it's not really. It's just a 1 plus 1 ES. That seems like a complete uh, misleading um, reference there. But how do you really solve this? Well, the first thing any good engineer is going to do is say, can I speed up my evaluation function? So I was able to reformulate the evaluation function so that instead of running in order in time, it runs in constant time. And then I'm going to apply local search. Local search will distribute a set of points around the moat. In other words, you just climb this hill, you get to this point, you get stuck. But the local search is unbiased. It's searching in all directions, and it just puts solutions all the way around the moat. That turns out to be important because for crossover to jump across, you need solutions that are more or less diametrically opposed in the space. But we found as soon as we had approximately 15 solutions, we had no problem at all with crossover jumping across to this point. So because I speeded up the evaluation function, because we can do the uh, intelligent local search in order in time, because the, cross, the population size here is tiny, we can actually get a global optimum in order in time easily on this problem. In fact, we can solve a million variable problem with a jump, uh, a, a jump gap of 20 bits, which is log of the 1 million in a fraction of a second. And that actually is a fast genetic algorithm. Okay, one last thought. Uh, I had this at, at, at the end of another talk recently. What if DNA is, is K-bounded? Certainly, this is an idea that um, uh, Stuart Kaufman has proposed in his uh, introduction of NK landscapes. He has put forward the theory that DNA may, is very well K-bounded in some sense. Um, if that's true and K is relatively small, and by small, you know, it could be 50 or it could be 100. It could still be large from, from a computational point of view. But if that's true, what if gene interactions look like this? So assume this is the interaction graph for uh, your DNA, okay? But we know that human beings share, what, 99% of their DNA, right? And if that's a K-bounded function, What if it looks like this when we delete all of those genes we share in common? It would mean that in many cases, maybe most of the time, evolution is not really looking in the space of all possible uh, variation. It's looking in the space of variation that is reachable given that we share a huge number of our genes. And that would give us a very different perspective on evolution. So with that, I'll stop. Uh, I'll stop screen sharing, and hopefully I've left about five minutes for questions, given that we started a little bit late and it's just now at the top of the hour. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Darren, for your talk. Sure. Thank you. There are already a couple of questions in the chat, so mm -hmm. I will read them by will people think of other questions. So Penusel, Penusel Machado is asking in your slides 78 and 79, uh, is he right to assume that the color gradient is just eye candy? I mean, that the 
it's just uh, optimal versus not optimal or he is he missing something uh it, it's not just eye candy because it allows you to keep track of an individual edge if you want to track that tour but yeah in some sense it's just eye candy it's just global versus non-global it's just that we want to when you look at, at those tours and you see orange here and, and orange over here, uh, you can sort of track those movements if you try to do recombination, for example. But eye candy is close enough in this case, unless you're really, really interested in, in tracking the edges. Okay. Um, there is another question about the max up phase transition. So the solvable to unsolvable phase transition in SAT is around 427. And this is a question from Dan Berg. So it looks like a sigmoid, he said. And then if you know or suspect that there is an analytical formula for, for this phase transition. OK, very good question. It looks like a sigmoid in terms of solvable goes through the phase transition, becomes unsolvable. In terms of the, the difficulty, it looks more like a, 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 you know, a, a Gaussian or, or something where it goes uh, uh, easy, 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 difficult, and then goes back down, easy, easy, easy. As far as I know, there is absolutely no analytical explanation as to why the phase transition is exactly at 4.27, whatever it happens to be. I don't know of any analytical explanation of that. Uh, certainly the early papers I read said this is an empirical observation, but it is highly repeatable. Uh, so, you know, that's a very good question. Why does it occur exactly where it occurs? It, it surely has to do with uh, being constrained, right? It makes sense that it's going to be, a, um, uh, uh, that, that as you increase the number of clauses, they become increasingly interconnected. But I don't know of an analytical explanation. Okay. Any other question? I'm not seeing any other in the... In the chat. So there is a follow-up question from Dan saying that you said that the hardest SAT problems are around this phase transition. How would you react if I hypothesize that the hardest problems are actually well beyond 4.27 in, yeah. in the dense region? Yeah, so it, it, it turns out that, that I'm oversimplifying. There are very hard problems that are away from the, the phase transition. It's just that they're statistically not as frequent. So uh, what I said about the graph itself is that if you generate a thousand problems in these regions, the probability that they will be difficult uh, is reflected in this distribution. That doesn't mean there aren't some very hard problems leaking, lurking over there in the tails somewhere. There can be, but you're, you're not as likely to see them. I would also point out that these are nothing like industrial problems. Uh, we have taken very large industrial uh, MAXAT problems and uh, computed their Fourier transform. And it turns out that their level of nonlinearity is very low. They, they tend to have uh, less than three n terms in the Fourier polynomial, uh, which uh, is much less than these randomly generated problems. OK. Um, apparently, there are no more questions. So, we'll, while more questions come, I will ask. Um, okay, so there is another question here related to maybe there is something in percolation theory from Bill from Bill Langdon. It's a very quick uh, percolation theory and the phase transition. Bill, I don't know exactly what he means. No, no, I, I know what he means okay. because I've had <laughs> the same thought. Uh, I didn't call it a percolation theory. I called it a uh, uh, a distillation theory. Uh, so if you think about those traveling salesman problems and those uh, those, th those visualizations we did, and, and I showed that you know the, the global edges are moving up in the population and the black edges are moving down in the population, if we can somehow harness uh, some kind of percolation theory or some sort of distillation theory that tells us how do we maximize the rate at which the colored edges goes up, and that the black edges goes down, we can definitely use that to create more efficient uh, uh, evolutionary algorithms for trying to solve these traveling salesman problems. So I, I think that's what Bill means by, by percolation. So hello, Bill, how are you doing today? <laughs> okay, I, I will ask one question then as well. I mean, I, I really like your work about crossover. Crossover is fundamental for GAs, for genetic algorithms, if we want to 
you know, compete with other metaheuristics. I have been recently working with neuroevolution and some other people in, in genetic programming. So we have, when we have more complex, complex representation, complex structure, it seems that the crossover uh, is not that useful sometimes. So I don't know if you have some thoughts about how we can make crossover and those more complex three uh, representation or linear, you know, that there is no fixed genotype length. How right. can we make crossover? Can we do some sort of partition crossovers in those domains? Well, there, there, that is a very, very old question. This goes back to around 1990 when um, I was one of the first people to point out that crossover was going to fail miserably on neural networks. Uh, Nick Radcliffe had the same observation. Dave Schaefer had the same observation. I'm sure there are other people, but those were the publications I saw early on. So there really is a challenge with trying to apply crossover. Now, some people have tried to uh, keep notes, do some tricks to try to make crossover more efficient. I've never been fully convinced that any of that works terribly well. Uh, I think it's still a difficult problem that if you want to, to try to, to, to do that, you, 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 there are some tricks. You can make your network asymmetric so that you break the symmetry. Right, uh, but again, I think it's still a problem, and and I don't think that problem has been fully solved at all. Okay, thank you. There are more. There are a couple of more questions. One from uh, Valentino Valentino Santucci. He's asking: In order to have local optima to recombine, you need to find them. ILS is a good schema to collect them, but what about an intelligent perturbation scheme? Is random perturb the best we can do? I. I'm not a fan of random perturbation, I, I, uh, unless you mean something like the following. You, you could generate a single local optimum and then do a random walk and reconverge and then do a random walk and reconverge. But I wouldn't call that, uh, I suppose that's one form of random per perturbation if it's a random walk. If you're talking about that, then yes, I think that's a viable strategy. If you're talking about just doing random search why do random search when you can do systematic search? Um, I just don't understand that because the, the systematic search is almost always better in terms of complexity. Um, and if you do need perturbation, then I would try the iterative uh, perturbation strategies, I think, the random walks. Okay, there is another one from Ole Mangshol. So he's asking, the G Giga is GA for TSP. So you need the initial population to contain all edges in an optimal tour to be present with high probability. Yep. Yes, that's true. Uh, for if you are only going to apply a partition crossover, you need all of those edges to be in the population. That's one reason for, for this strategy that we are now using, which is apply to op, apply uh, the mixing GA with uh, the uh, partition crossover move all of the good edges up to the top of the population, then apply EAX because the EAX can introduce edges you might be missing. We have found that the EAX will often run uh, two, three, four times faster if you have enriched the edges in the population. Now, if all the edges are there, then this uh, mixing GA or, or gigaform of GA will often converge very rapidly, but sometimes not. It, it's a little un difficult to, to predict. Uh, any more questions? No, there is no more questions. Okay, so I think we we, ha we have reached the end of, of the keynote. So thank you again, Daryl, right. for, for your Thank talk. you, everyone. Thank you for everybody who attended. Uh, I appreciate it. Okay.